Hi. Wow, that was, that was so sweet. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Leighton Gray. I am uh, the co-creator, co-writer, and art director of a little indie game called Dream Daddy, a dad dating simulator. I like already know that I'm in good company because you guys like dads as much as I do. Um, but I'm currently the art director at the Fulbright Company, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Games Connect Asia Pacific 2018. So the theme of this year's GCAP is the walls we've built ourselves. Let's unpack that a little bit. We've forged so much pro progress in this industry in the past 50 years that it is a little bit mind-boggling to think about. Technically, te technically narratively, artistically, uh, we've gone from being a niche interest to being a ubiquitous, inescapable, multi-billion dollar industry. Even in the past 10 years alone, the way that the industry has exponentially exploded is just really wild and exciting to think about. And we've built this entire framework out of nothing, these towering walls of games of all sorts. But with a world that's changed so much since we were starting out as an industry, is the foundation that it's all based on still serving us? I think that it's time for us to take a closer look at what these walls are actually made out of, what they're built on, what they're holding in, and probably more importantly, what they might be keeping out. And to do that, we need to revisit where it all began and what that means for where we're headed. So today, we're gonna talk about history, and more specifically, art history. <laughs> um, and beyond that, I'd like to share some insights on what I've learned over my time in the industry, and especially in regards to how, in the sweet hell, do we make our work stand out against the constant stream of noise of the internet? So you might be asking, but Leighton, isn't it kind of strange to do a keynote talk for a video games conference and immediately do a deep dive on art history and internet culture? Actually, no, hypothetical audience member straw man that I just made up. I would argue that many of the walls that we've built are problematic because of the fact that we have a tendency to not contextual vi contextualize video games within the larger history of art and media, which is part partially played into by the failure of uh, people who don't really play video games to not view video games as the art that they are. Um, but we will get back to that in a few minutes. So let's get into it. To start, we need to backtrack a little bit. So modernism was the first major art movement of the early 20th century. It came in on the heels of the Romantic movement, which was all about aestheticizing intense emotion, and it was extremely melodramatic and lofty. So in response, modernism focused on defying the traditional ideas of the, of the 19th century. This movement neatly coincided with and was spurred on by the Industrial Revolution. Everything was changing, the world was in a state of flux, and so artists and writers wanted their work to reflect that. The movement encouraged creatives to try new things and explore unorthodox ideas with enthusiasm and to question everything. Artists like Picasso, Duchamp, Kandinsky, and writers like James Joyce and Marcel Proust are hallmark examples of modernism. They were all doing things that nobody had seen before. And the most important point that I can hammer home about modernism is that it was deeply sincere with little to no self-consciousness. And this was all well and good, and everyone was excited about making stuff. And then we weathered the atrocities of World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, the rise of the atomic bomb, and the Vietnam War. Scholars argue about when exactly the, the modern, or excuse me, the postmodern movement started, but the exact year doesn't really matter for our purposes here. But what does matter is that due to this nonstop news cycle of violence and strife, and that it was more widely publicized than ever before, we started to collectively become kind of hardened towards the optimistic ideals of modernism. And just like how the Industrial Revolution ushered in a new era with its technological advances, the increasing spread of televisions and broadcasting around the world created an immense shift in how we related to media. And because of this, the Vietnam War was the first war to be majorly televised. The senseless carnage and violence was available to watch in the comfort of your living room for the first time ever. And all of these overarching post-enlightenment ideas and meta-narratives about how war always brings about revolution and is for the greater good were crumbling before our eyes because we had the evidence to prove it. And the growing disparity between what we were watching happen on TV versus the lies the government was feeding us caused a really deep sense of distrust and cynicism. And the growing commercialism of late-stage capitalism that was clearly thriving during wartime didn't help either. And so began the era of postmodernism. As a response to the modernist movement, the core pillars of postmodernism were cynicism, irony, nihilism, the idea that truth is a subjective construct, and it made things like parody and pastiche popular. 
Postmodernism leaned really heavily on critiquing society, modern media that now seemed mawkish and naive, rampant commercialism, and pretty much anything that could have holes poked in it. And some good examples of postmodernism are the works of Andy Warhol, David Foster Wallace, William S. Burroughs, Jackson Pollock, and Samuel Beckett. And the horror movie Scream is actually a great modern example of a postmodern movie because it explicitly calls out the tropes that it's mocking and flirts with the fourth wall by having the characters acknowledge them. South Park is also really postmodern. I mean, the entire premise is just cynically making fun of everything and painting those who are even remotely emotionally invested in literally anything as wrong and dumb. So postmodernism just so happened to define the global culture in the 70s, 80s, 90s, when the games industry was beginning to pick up speed. Video games were birthed in an era defined by cynicism, so it makes sense that we have a long history of our community being defined by snark, irony, and distrust towards other mainstream media. And the same people who were interested in gaming, who I am going to affectionately refer to as nerds, also ended up being a lot of the first users of the internet. Early gaming culture was rooted in this spirit of community, where between shareware games and excitement over this new medium, people were generally very collaborative and encouraged open exploration and experimentation with new ideas. And so because of the overlap in gamers and early adopters of the internet, it's safe to say that gaming culture and internet culture have always fed off of each other. Those pillars of openness and exploration that gamers carried into online spaces led to the internet becoming what it is today. I mean, it's not a coincidence that some of the earliest viral internet memes are sourced from video games. Sorry, I gotta hydrate. This talk secretly about hydrating, it's important. And also accidentally choke, choking on water in the middle of a talk. Dope, I love it. Um, but I think it just speaks to how rapidly the internet has evolved since even just 1999, that throwing these vintage memes up here feels <laughs> pretty cringy. So where does that leave us now? The year is 2018. Last year, Steam grossed over $4.3 billion, with a B, averaging around 21 games uploaded per day. Steam takes a whopping 30% cut of your game's sales, despite their increasingly hands-off approach to the platform. Steam Greenlight is dead. Getting your game on Steam is easier than ever, but getting noticed has never been harder. The games industry has birthed a media empire through YouTube, Let's Plays, and Twitch, with the gaming influencers sitting at the top making hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars from talking over video games, with scads of less popular Let's Players and streamers struggling to be seen by anyone at all. And instead of buying your game, people can just watch Markiplier play it on YouTube for free. We have ridiculously talented devs destroying their lives and health to get their games made, and often for less than minimum wage. Despite the constant discussion over and condemnation of crunch and corporate culture that alienates anyone who is not a straight white man, there are issues that are kind of treated like they're unavoidable when they're absolutely and completely avoidable. We have players who encourage this, who care more about a game and its characters than they do about the safety, health, and well-being of the real people who are creating them. And you know what? It's because we have companies who think the same thing. We are surrounded by a gamer culture of fan entitlement, toxic masculinity, gatekeeping, harassment, racism, homophobia, misogyny, and general lack of compassion for others. We have gamers who despise the idea that anyone else but them might dare enjoy a video game. We have game developers who are women, who are people of color, who are trans, who are disabled, and who are queer, who face this culture that not only doesn't welcome them, but often openly reviles them and lets them know too, loudly and often, to the point that many potential minority game developers are too scared to make anything at all. <sighs> the year is 2018, and things are bad. But on the flip side, the year is 2018, and things are good, actually. Steam and platforms like itch.io make publishing a game and putting it in front of millions of people ridiculously easy. We have platforms like Kickstarter and Patreon to help games get funded and to help devs get paid a living wage. Unity, Blender, Twine, and Ink, et cetera, are all free. There are so many resources online for learning how to make games that pretty much anyone with the gumption can do it and get it in front of the right people. And through Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook, you can talk to other game developers from all over the world, get advice, find support or job openings or potential employees, and engage in the global community even if you live in the middle of nowhere. The Let's Play and streaming industries create yet another avenue for your game to get recognized. Excuse me where a YouTuber with millions of subscribers can play your tiny indie game for a few episodes and create visibility and a huge spike of sales that you would have never have seen otherwise. 
We have an unprecedented level of transparency and reporting on issues in the industry, and active communities full of passionate people trying to make things better. It's a slow process because positive change always is, but it's an uphill climb. Just look at the outpouring of support for the recent Telltale layoffs and how the community rallied around helping these people find work. And with the accessibility of tools available online, the barrier of entry into the industry has never been lower. And that's allowing people who 10 years ago might never have been able to break in to make amazing games. And there are so many devs from so many walks of life making so many different, interesting niche things that the diversity in what we have available to play is incredible. We've made many important strides in terms of diversity and representation that have rippled from indie spaces into AAA. And gaming culture <laughs> has a problem, for sure, but it's a problem that we as game makers and game consumers have decided to no longer tolerate. Conditions are improving and we're moving forward with what we want to make regardless of what the vocal minority has to say about it. The thing is, is that we've built these walls ourselves and we can choose the way that we look at them. The only reason we've made these amazing strides forward is because we fought tooth and nail for them with passion and integrity, because we sincerely care about the games industry and making it a better place. And in the year 2018, is it really, truly serving us to keep clinging to postmodern ideals? Does it really help us to approach these issues in our community with cynicism, distrust, and a lack of faith in humanity? Does it actually help us solve these issues to see things through a glass half empty lens? Or is it just demotivating us and making us all exhausted and miserable? Look, postmodernism has gone stale. What was once used as a tool to fight against the establishment is now the establishment. Cynicism is mainstream, everyone is a critic, Twitter runs on hot takes, and Twitter runs on hot takes so hard that Wendy's is now roasting people on Twitter and we seem to think that's cute and not so important of a capital dysto capitalist dystopian nightmare. The thing is, to quote the great David Lynch, negativity is the enemy of creativity. Irony stands for nothing. It is a deconstruction, and there's nothing left to meaningfully deconstruct. David Foster Wallace puts it very cogently in an essay that he wrote in the early 90s called E Unibus Plurum, where he outlines what he saw as our growing problem with irony. And this is coming from one of the major figureheads of the postmodern movement. Here's an excerpt that explains it better than I can. All US irony is based on an implicit, I don't really mean what I say. So what does irony as a cultural norm mean to say? That it's impossible to mean what you say? That maybe it's too bad it's impossible, but wake up and smell the coffee already. Most likely, I think, today's irony ends up saying, how very banal to ask what I mean. Anyone with the heretical gall to ask an ironist what he actually stands for ends up looking like a hysteric or a prig. And herein lies the oppressiveness of institutionalized irony, the too successful rebel. The ability, ability to interdict the question without attending to its content is tyranny. It is the new junta using the very tool that exposed its enemy to insulate itself. This is why our educated teleholic friends' use of weary cynicism to try to seem superior to TV is so pathetic. That was written in 1993, spot on. So if we're past modernism's earnest but maybe a little naive exploration of ideas, and we're exhausted by postmodernism sneering cynicism, where does that put us now? How can we describe current media that is innovating on and borrowing from both of these movements? I don't know, and that's it, bye. It's metamodernism, which is defined by ironic detachment with sincere engagement. Now, you can also call it post-postmodernism or new sincerity, which is a slightly different thing. But for our purposes, I like the term metamodernism. The name comes uh, not from something being meta in a self-aware way, although a lot of metamodern media is. It comes from the word medixy, meaning an in-betweenness. And the metamodernist manifesto was written by artist Luke Turner and the man, the meme, the legend himself, Shia LaBeouf. Here's a basic rundown of the core tenets of metamodernism. It acknowledges that prescribing exclusively to either just modern or postmodern ideas limits our ability to tell robust, complex stories, and that the best storytelling comes from oscillating between two poles, primarily sincerity and cynicism, but also highbrow and lowbrow, optimism and doubt, relativism and truth, etc. Further, metamodern media also aims to collapse distances between disparate groups of people. 
meaning that it not only embraces diversity, inclusivity, and representation, but it also emphasizes that despite all of our differences, we as humans have a lot more in common than we think. It acknowledges the layered identities we present both online and in real life. We all live really multifaceted existences, and metamodernism acknowledges that people can't just be shoved into boxes. So good metamodern media explores our relationship with ourselves and how we interact with the world. And finally, it embodies a sense of radical optimism and self-love in the face of decades of postmodernism's unbridled cynicism, which I gotta say, sounds pretty nice. One of the most notable things about metamodernism is that the parameters are extremely loose. Media doesn't have to ascribe to all of these tenets to be considered metamodern. And this idea is commonly referred to as an affective feeling, since metamodern media often borrows, mutates, and remixes elements from modernism and postmodernism. So to give you a better idea of what I'm talking about here, let's look at some games that I would consider postmodern versus some ones that I think are firmly metamodern. The Stanley Parable and Portal both deconstruct traditional ideas surrounding player agency, and the game like Sonic Dreams Collection lampoons Sonic fan culture. All three of these games are pretty resoundingly cynical and feature varying degrees of subversion in their respective genres. Progressing past this era of postmodern work, we have games like Undertale and Doki Doki Literature Club. The distinction here is that both of these games are deconstructions of deconstructions. Undertale is particularly notable in this sense because it plays with RPG tropes in a couple of different ways. The fact that the player is constantly faced with choosing between pacifism and violence and then has to live with the consequences is very metamodern because, again, it's that oscillation between these poles without totally reconciling them. And then you have characters who are aware of your previous actions and comment on them and break the fourth wall by making direct appeals to the player. So, Doki Doki Literature Club. <sighs> Sorry to leave you guys hanging. Uh, is on one level a deconstruction and commentary on a lighthearted dating sim and all of the trappings of the genre. Your childhood best friend, a blank slate male main character, and it takes place in a high school. And then as the game starts to take a darker turn, it plays off, off of horror tropes as well, and then becomes extremely meta once Monica begins addressing the player directly, and it even requires you to go into the game's files to beat the game. And the game manages to simultaneously be cutesy, sweet, and endearing, while also absolutely horrific. It allows the player to hold both of these ideas at once. And I believe that it's no coincidence that these two games have enjoyed a lot of success and have garnered massive fandoms, because I think metamodern media really speaks to where we exist culturally right now. We're burned out on cynicism, but we can't quite cold turkey off of it just yet. We yearn for earnest and earnestness and honesty, because we're human, but we also don't seem to want media that's 100% sincere just yet. Basically, we want the media that we consume to reflect our lives, a glass that is simultaneously both half empty and half full. Further, I'd like to point out that there is already a lot of media that ascribes to these tenets, and it is also no coincidence that all of these pieces of media really resonate with people. Examples include Rick and Morty, Childish Gambino's Music, Bojack Horseman, Bo Burnham's stand-up comedy, Black Mirror, Homestuck, R.I.P., uh, shows like Barry and uh, Hannah Gadsby's special Nanette, and also a show like The Good Place. So, just like how the Industrial Revolution spurred on the modernist movement and the advent of television kickstarted postmodernism, the internet and metamodernism are best friends. <laughs> and your work can hit all of the points that I just talked about. It can have a sincere emotional through line with a cheeky exterior. It can be full of diverse characters. It might help the player learn more about themselves. And it might be very thematically optimistic. And it can still get lost in the sea of noise. So how do we combat this? And before I answer that question, I just want to preface my spiel on the internet real quick. If you're unfamiliar with Dream Daddy, a dad dating simulator, the dating sim where you play as a hot dad and your goal is to meet and romance other hot dads while raising your 18-year-old daughter who's about to leave for college, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> But the entire idea is that we lured people in with this cheeky exterior of like, come kiss dads, it's silly. And then pleasantly surprised players with a really heartfelt story about fatherhood, growing up in a single parent household, and generally what it means to care for another person. This was extremely intentional on our part. By Trojan horsing, horsing in a serious, well-written story through what looked like just another silly dating sim, we actually unseated PUBG as the top selling game on Steam globally within hours of launch. And thank you. 
Um, and things generally spiraled out of control from there. And we've been lucky enough to enjoy a lot of success, and I'm really proud to say that there is still a large and active fandom of daddies out there. And <coughs> there's a tie-in comic book series with Oni Press that's coming out, <coughs> and the PS4 port comes out next week. <coughs> and I say all of this not to brag. All right, maybe like a little bit. But I say this because I just want to show that when it comes to internet stuff, I kind of know what I'm talking about sometimes. So let's get into the theory behind it. We're currently experiencing a huge cultural shift from mass media to social media. We've gone from a top-down model of distribution to a participatory culture where consumers are not just consumers of static, unchanging content. They're people who are reshaping and remixing the context and meaning of media. A story is something that the creator and the audience get to build together, so it's important to keep that in mind from day one of development. And the language that currently exists around content that becomes successful on the internet unnecessarily mystifies this entire process. When we say that something goes viral, we we're robbing both the content creator and the audience of their agency, like we're just passively infecting each other with content, which is not how it works. And consulting, marketing, and PR firms will dangle this concept of going viral above your heads to get you to give them money, and to in intentionally muddy the process of what it takes to create a successful product. And we can even track where this kind of thinking originated. The term meme was introduced in 1976 in Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, as the cultural corollary of the gene. The idea being that a meme propagates itself in the way similar to genes. And I kid you not, he uses the phrase meme pool, which is a pretty fun mental image. And this sort of biological metaphor is a big reason why we oversimplify this process down to virality. And so if virality is not helping us, what will? And this idea to counter virality is called spreadability, the intersection of qualities that optimize content through sharing, for sharing through social media. And this model recognizes that the driving force behind what we share comes from a social place, and that there isn't some magical, unknowable incantation that makes something go viral. Rather, we use the media we consume to facilitate conversations that we're already having. Excuse me, I always get stress burps doing talks, which is cool and fun. Um, but we, we've always done this. Like, we've been uh, sharing things from a social place forever as humans. So the moment that we see a piece of content on social media, before we're even consciously aware of it, our brain is already making decisions about its shareability. A 2011 study by a group of psychologists at UCLA put a bunch of students through an fMRI scan as they were exposed to different pitches for a variety of TV shows and instructed to role play as interns and to take note of the pitches that they would potentially want to share with producers. The psychologists determined that the moment the group of students role-playing as interns were first exposed to an idea that they would ultimately decide to share with the producers, this area in the brain called the temporal parietal junction would light up. The temporal parietal junction is actually part of the outer layer of the brain called the mentalization network. Mentalizing is the process of understanding how other people think and feel, and this entire network is engaged when we see something that we might potentially share with others. And this is the same part of the brain that theoretically would have been engaged when ancient humans dragged a fresh kill back to their tribe. We're deeply wired to want to share things of quality with those that we care about. And even though the TPJ's connection with social media is still being researched, we can use this information to our advantage by looking at the kinds of rapid-fire questions we're subconsciously thinking when we see an interesting post on social media. Namely, is this content worth engaging with? Is it worth sharing? What's the best platform to spread it through? Might it be of interest to specific people? Does it convey something about who I am or my relationship with others? And does it reflect the values of my community? And some questions that you'll want to ask yourself in your design process to make sure that the answers to all of those questions are a resounding yes, you'll want to think about, is it portable, quotable, or grabbable? Is it available when and where audiences want it? Is it easily reusable in a variety of ways? Is it relevant to multiple audiences and who? And is it part of a steady stream of material? Because so much of the way that people interact with games now takes place outside of playtime in fan communities and on social media, encouraging this kind of engagement is essential for ensuring that your game is spreadable. And there are a couple of different things you can do to create a game that leaves room for people to sink their teeth into the work and run with it. And with the way that this participatory culture works, you as a dev kind of need to start being okay with relinquishing a certain amount of control of your IP. Think about it like this. You hand somebody a finished novel. 
They'll read it and they'll have a good time, sure, but what if you handed the same person a Mad Lib and told them to fill it in? And then you hand hundreds of other people the same Mad Lib, uh, they're all gonna have different ways of filling in the blanks and they're gonna be so much more engaged because they got to decide what the story means to them. This is actually called the Ikea effect, which is a real psychology term and not a thing that I just made up, where people feel deeper investment in things when they have a part in building it. And some things that can create these little Ikea gaps for players include shared fantasies, humor, parody, references, and intertextuality, unfinished content, mysteries, timely controversy and discourse, and rumors. With Dream Daddy, we had all of these, so much of the rumors and timely controversy, and, but it, ultimately it kind of serves your product better because more people are going to be looking at it and sharing, and uh, yeah, if we had had a tight hold on the whole thing and we're like, no memes allowed, no memeing, and instead, we kind of encouraged it and retweeted stuff and told people like, hey, we're, we're happy to like share the things that you've made. Um, and I know that it can be really difficult to relinquish some of the control, but giving people room to remix, pay homage to, and meme elements of your work not only creates a community where everyone feels more invested in a property because they're able to help shape the context of the work, it also creates this network of entry points for, people to, for more people to be exposed to your product. Traditional marketing and PR avenues are obviously still very important, and I've definitely done my fair share of regurgitating press releases, but as you can see, grassroots rallying from fans casts a much wider net that is not only going to re reach a wider audience, but people are so much more likely to be interested in your game when it's being endorsed by someone they know or respect rather than just being hawked at them by an advertisement. It again boils down to the grassroots sincere recommendation from a friend versus what we call astroturfing, the artificial cynical shilling from a corporation. Because let's face it, nobody wants to be marketed to, especially while they're playing a game or just trying to read their friends' hot takes on Facebook. And the same demographic that responds positively to the principles of metamodernism consists of a bunch of young people who hate all of the trappings of late capitalism, so you need to be tactful about it, or else you are going to start getting roasted by 13-year-olds on Twitter. And let me tell you, that shit's not fun. And marketing shouldn't be your last step, it should be your first. It should be an ongoing conversation throughout the development process. Understanding who your game is for, what that community values, and how your game can facilitate, subvert, or reinforce the conversations that people are already having. Getting your work to spread online is partially about strategy, but it's also about understanding the way that people relate to media. And it comes from a place of sincerity, not cynicism. Media you relate to cynically is a fleeting part of your life. It's a quick tweet or a five minute article. But media that you relate to sincerely can follow you through your whole life. And to really drive that point home, I'd like to do a little exercise with you guys, if that is okay. Um, so I'd like for you to think about a game that was really important to you growing up. It can be for any reason. Um, you love the characters, the story really spoke to you, it helped you through a rough time. Maybe you just liked the art. Maybe you have fond memories of playing that game with your friends or a cousin. What was the game that made you love games? Why was it so formative? What did it mean to you? How has it shaped your career in the industry? And how has it shaped you as a person? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put five minutes on the clock and I'm gonna ask you to share that game and your reasons with your neighbor. And I'm gonna share first. I'm gonna go off script and be candid and cool about it. Um, so I think my pick for this game would probably be Animal Crossing Wild World because when I was a child, uh, I kind of grew up in an environment that was really scary and unsafe and being able to have like this pocket oasis that I could just pull out and uh, be in debt to Tom Nook forever was actually like really beautiful and calming and relaxing and just having this space that I could go to where the art's beautiful and everyone's excited to see you and um, I also didn't have a lot of like older friends or you know, men or anybody who would be like, oh, hey, you should totally play Legend of Zelda. I would just get whatever trickled down or that my parents saw in Walmart and were like, here you go. So uh, it, this has informed my sensibilities in terms of what I want to make in that, you know, I want to make games that are accessible to people who might never otherwise play games. Something that can be relaxing, something that's not too difficult, um, and that can just kind of like provide a respite from the pains of the world sometimes. So. Uh, I'm going to do the five minutes thing, and I'm also going to make a very friendly and polite request that you don't look at your phone for the five minutes. Um, and I'm gonna yell at you if you do. 
I, I'm not, but you know, honor code. Because I really want you to stay present to what you're sharing and what others are sharing. And you know, if you can't get into duos or if you kind of go through it with the other person, you know, share with another neighbor. So uh, let's do it. <laughs> go. I'm gonna stand up here and drink water awkwardly. <laughs> and that's time. Thank you guys for humoring me there. I really appreciate that. Uh, I hope you're able to learn something about yourself and maybe your new friends. Um, because the thing is, all of us here, we know how important games are. We know how formative that they've been to our personal lives, our passions, our careers, our friends. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this room right now. We are so, so lucky to be living in a time where it is easier than ever to create and spread ideas and enjoy the work of people who, in the past, would have never have had access to these kinds of tools, or who wouldn't have had the opportunities for their voices to be heard. The internet in this, has revolutionized this industry in a way that can oftentimes be really frustrating, but in reality, it's the most valuable tool that we have. And we can't just keep letting the vocal minority in, in the gaming community define what the medium gets to be, what we get to say, and who it's for. The idea that we could be reaching out to demographics of people who would have never touched a game otherwise, creating an avenue for kids to see themselves represented, or just inspiring people to create in the, way, in the same way that the games you all just talked about did, is so precious. And the way that we do that is by staying true to that young kid inside of you who loved Animal Crossing, or Legend of Zelda, or whatever else. Whatever you're making, if you're sincere, that sincerity is going to shine through your game and touch others. And I'd like to close with one more passage from that David Foster Wallace essay that I talked about earlier. The next real literary rebels in this country might well emerge as some weird bunch of anti-rebels, foreign ogglers who dare somehow to back away from ironic watching, who have the childish gall actually to an endorse and instantiate single entendre principles, who treat of plain old untrendy human, human troubles and emotions in US life with reverence and conviction, who eschew self-consciousness and hip fatigue. These anti-rebels would be outdated, of course, before they even started. Dead on the page, too sincere, clearly repressed. Backward, quaint, naive, anachronistic. Maybe that'll be the point. Maybe that's why they'll be the next real rebels. Real rebels, as far as I can see, risk disapproval. The old postmodern insurgents risked the gasp and squeal, shock, disgust, outrage, censorship, accusations of socialism, anarchism, nihilism. Today's risks are different. The new rebels might be artists willing to risk the yawn, the rolled eyes, the cool smile, the nudged ribs, the parody of gifted ironists, the oh, how banal, to risk accusations of sentimentality, melodrama, of overcredulity, of softness a willingness to be suckered by a world of lurkers and starers who fear gaze and ridicule above imprisonment without law. Who knows? So we might have built these walls out of cynicism, but we can break them down with sincerity. Thank you, and have a wonderful GCAP. And uh, this is my dog. If you want to learn more about metamodernism or spreadability or, or just check out some of the other sources, and I actually have some links to uh, places where I've kind of gone into a micro level on how we use these things to, for Dream Daddy's like marketing and design. So check it out. It's cool. And uh, take care, everybody. Yay.